Hey there, and welcome back to another episode of Foot Traffic. I am so excited because today I have Michael Hyatt here with me. Michael, welcome to the show. I'm so excited to have you on. Hey, thanks, Stacey. Glad to be on. Yeah, so Michael, I've, I've been following you for years, and all of a sudden I'm on my phone not too long ago, and I get targeted with your Facebook ad of this amazing new book called Your World Class Assistant. And at the time, I was desperately in need of hiring one, so I purchased the book, dove right in, and then eventually gave that book to my assistant to say, let's get on the same page. So I'm so excited to really dive into why an executive assistant or what you call a world-class assistant and how to really find and leverage um, and make this assistant, get them on the same page as you, because I know that can be so incredibly difficult. It, it definitely can be. And I think my experience is that most executives and leaders either don't have an assistant, which sort of by necessity relegates their work to a lot of things they have no business doing and isn't the best and highest use of them. Or if they do have an assistant, they're way under utilizing their assistant because they just don't esteem them enough or have a high enough view of what they're capable of. Yeah, there's little things that I just thought I'll never be able to outsource this. Like having somebody pick the airline or the date and time I'm going to leave for a trip and come back. Like just things where I thought, no, 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 there's no system. It's just in my head and I'm the only one that can figure it out. And you soon realize as you start to leverage the assistant, what they really are capable of. And that is freedom. Totally. And I think of an executive assistant as really my primary partner. You know, the person that enables me to do what I do best to do more of what I do best and to stay focused on the things that, you know, where I really add value to the company and to the clients that I'm trying to serve. And again, keeps me out of the things where I'm just not that passionate or don't have enough skill to really pull it off in a, in a good way. Yeah. When do you know when it's time to hire? Do you need a 40 hour a week position? What does that look like in case somebody's wondering how much money is this going to cost or how much time do I need to really be delegating? Yeah, I think if you've ever had the thought, you probably need one. You know, in fact, you're probably three months behind the curve by the time you have the first thought that you need somebody. And I waited too long. When I started my current business, Michael Hyde and Company, I thought, well, I'm a solopreneur and I'm not sure I can afford one. And gosh, it seems like additional risk, additional expense. I need to make sure that I've got my, you know, uh, sources of revenue really coming in so that I can pay for it. And that was really backwards thinking because it's not until you invest in somebody that it frees you up to do those kind of revenue producing activities that are, that are so critical. And the cool thing now, and I was under the uh, assumption that it was kind of all or nothing. I had to hire either somebody full time or do without. But today, because of various companies out there that serve entrepreneurs and leaders, uh, it's possible to get an executive assistant for as few as you know, 10 hours a week. And I did that when I first started. In fact, I first started five hours a week. And in two weeks, I increased that to 10 hours a week. Two weeks later, I increased it to like 15 hours a week. And then it steadily went up until I had somebody that was working basically full time. Yeah, that's amazing. And when you first had somebody coming in for five hours, what sort of tasks were you delegating right away? Well, this is going to be different for everybody because it depends on, you know, kind of where your passion and your proficiency are. So we have a tool in my book, Free to Focus, called the Freedom Compass that helps you self-assess on this and identify those activities where you have the most passion and the most proficiency. Those typically are the activities where you're going to create the most leverage for your business, add the most value to your business and clients, and really move your business forward. So for me, what that looks like is anytime I can create content, deliver content, or sort of be the architect of the vision for the future of my business, those are my strengths, and that's where I need to be focused. The things that are the exact opposite of, of that, we call the drudgery zone in the Freedom Compass. This is where I have no passion, no proficiency. For me, this would be uh, managing my own email inbox, yes. you know, checking voicemail, managing my calendar, booking travel, filing expense reports. That kind of stuff for me is drudgery. Mm -hmm. You know, not only is it boring, but I dread it. I procrastinate it. And when I finally get around to doing it, I'm not very good at it. I can tell you email has been one of those things that I just, I, I despise email so much and it can just suck you in. And as I was bringing on our executive assistant, I all of a sudden realized 
I was spending way too much time on my email. There was most of it's junk. Most of it's things I don't need to respond to reply to. And now she just puts the right emails in front of me that I need to see and the rest she takes care of. And that has been the biggest game changer for me. So I appreciate you kind of explaining. It's not a one size fits all. Everybody has to really start to assess what that looks like. Um, and, and I, I'm happy to hear you say, you can do it with just five hours. You can do it with just 10. Because I know people have that all or nothing mentality and that's why they wait too long to finally hire somebody. Totally, it's gotta be like baby steps. And I approach any new in initiative, Stacy, as though it's an experiment. You know, so like, it's, it's like, okay, well, let's, let's try this. You know, if it makes a difference, great. If it doesn't, I'll try something out mm -hmm. or something else. And one of the things I discovered when I got my very first uh, executive assistant, kind of in my own business, I'd, I'd worked in the corporate world where my previous position before I started this company, I had full, two full-time executive assistants. And even then I was way underutilizing them. But when I started my own business, I thought I'm gonna just approach this as an experiment, let's see. It freed up not just the five hours that that executive assistant was working, but she was doing in five hours what, would it, what it was taking me about 10 hours to do. So it basically freed up 10 hours a week, mm -hmm. which I could reinvest in those mm -hmm. revenue producing activities that move my business forward. I mean, just like that, I paid for. Yeah. And so that's why I increased the hours. I love it. So when you're going to hire somebody, are you using certain personality tests? Are you looking for certain characteristics? What does that look like for this position? Yeah. So in our business accelerator program, which is our business coaching program, we teach a hiring process that has six discrete steps. And I don't have time to go through all of them, but let me tell you where it starts. You've got to have a clear job description. Everything in life begins with a clear vision of, of what it is that you want to create. And that's nowhere more true than when you're hiring staff. You got to be clear what you want them to do. If you're not clear, you're in for a frustrating experience and they're in for a frustrating experience. So that's where I would start. The second thing I would do is that, you know, actually this is not sequential. There's many intervening steps, yeah, yeah. but once you start getting a pool of candidates and you're trying to narrow it down, you're thinking, gosh, who do I hire? These people all look amazing. You know, maybe they all have got this, the right qualifications, but one of the most important filters, filters that you can use and a test that we use, an assessment is called Colby, K-O-L-B-E. And you can find them at colby.com. We have no affiliation with them other than we are rabid users of their assessment. It measures something different than any other personality test. Some personality tests measure your uh, cognitive skills, you know, your thinking skills, you know, Wonderlick would be a good example of that. Others uh, sort of measure your personality or your emotional state. You know, Myers-Briggs would be a good example, even Strength Finders. But what Colby measures is something they call your conative ability. And this is how you initiate work, you know, and, and we're all different. Are you familiar with the test? Uh, a little bit, yeah. Okay. We, we don't specifically use this in our business, but I've heard of Colby. Okay, so, so Colby's so cool because... Um, it, it measures you along four different axes. Like some people initiate work, you give them a project and they start by researching. You know, they're the people that go to Google and they track down every possible source. You know, they, they start with research. There are people that start with what they call follow through. These are the people that get everything organized. They get a step-by-step -step plan and then they start. There are other people called quick start and I'm a quick start. Definitely. And we, <laughs> I'm definitely we, one too. <laughs> okay. So we just try stuff. You know, it's like, yeah. You know, our, our motto is uh, ready, fire, aim. Mm -hmm. you know, so we just, we do something and then we correct as we go. And then there's people that are, that are implementers. And those are people that have to get hands on, get their hands on it, get it in the physical space, you know, just kind of feel what it's, it's going to be like. So here's what's brilliant about Colby. They have a system called the right fit system. So you take the assessment for yourself so that you as the hiring manager kind of know what your cognitive score is. Then you give another Colby test to your candidates, and then they fit that based on the job profile and your personality, and Colby gives you a letter grade back as to the fit. Wow. So for example, we don't hire anyone who's not at least a B plus or greater. Every time we've thought we were smarter than the test, that, that the person was really, you know, was perfect in every way, and even though we got a bad 
you know, right fit number back from Colby, we are still going to hire him. Every time we've done that, it's been a disaster. Wow. That's interesting that you've gambled on the, the less than a B plus, and then you've realized, okay, this, this isn't working for us. Yeah. And, and it's important to say that this is not the only filter. Obviously they have the right, have to have the right experience. They have to have the right skill set. They have to have, you know, all these other things that we would typically measure for, you know, references, check out and all that kind of stuff. But Colby is the one thing that nobody else provides that for us is kind of the linchpin for great hiring. Yeah. Out of those four different types of people, what person are you looking for for that world-class assistant? It depends on your personality profile. Oh, okay. Yeah. So for example, if you're, and, and this is one of the things you have to avoid and Colby calls it uh, conative cloning. Because sometimes an entrepreneur will say to themselves, man, if I could just find somebody just like me that thinks the way I do, that's motivated by the same things, that approaches work the same way, I would be golden. No, that's the exact worst thing that you could do. You don't need a clone. One of you is enough. What you need is a conative compliment, somebody that compliments. So if you're high on quick start, you know, chances are you're probably not long on follow through. So you come up with an idea a minute, you're very creative, creative, you're imaginative, you like to start a lot of stuff, you have difficulty finishing it. You need somebody that's on a long on follow through so you can throw the pass and they can carry it into the end zone. Conversely, if you're long on follow through, you may need somebody that's high on quick start. So it depends on what you as the hiring manager, what your cognitive profile is. That's so interesting. And you know, a lot of times uh, we, uh, people will work off of referrals like, oh, you've got this social media manager. Does she have an extra 20 hours? And they assume because she's a good social media manager for this person, she'll be one for me. And the way that you're saying is, but what if you two are different personalities, right. the working relationship will be very different. That is, wow. Like that's a, a big aha right there for me, for sure. Good, good, good. Yeah. Now um, with an EA, it can be, a little scary to give somebody your credit card, have them have access to your email, uh, very personal things and passwords and things like that. How do you get through or, or kind of break through that fear of giving somebody something like that information? Yeah, well, it, it can be challenging. And, you know, it's, it's certainly something you don't want to just do without considerable thought. Mm -hmm. You know, this is one of the reasons why in hiring, you know, we uh, advocate a criminal background check, you know, uh, an agreement that specifies their confidentiality or requires their confidenti confidentiality, non-disclosure kinds of agreements, all that kind of stuff. But given that they've passed all that and they've met, you know, the experience requirement, the education requirements, they're a Colby fit, you know, you've checked the references and all that, then what I would do, I didn't, I, I wouldn't just hand over everything at once, but I'd hand over one thing at a time, right? Mm -hmm. So like, so for example, the more that they have, the more effective they're going to be. So that's your goal. So my executive assistant, Jim, is like, he's got the total keys to my kingdom. Yeah. You know, he knows enough about me to be able to rip off my identity, to be able to, you know, drain my bank accounts, most of them, all that kind of stuff. But he's worked for me for almost five years now. Mm -hmm. Phenomenal asset. But he can do just about anything I ask him to do because he has that kind of access. So I would just start small. And then as they prove themselves trustworthy, you hand off more and more information. Yeah. And that's so, uh, it's, it's good to hear you say that too, of, of having those little tests or little things like we're going to start here. But what I want people to hear too, is if you keep that control when they are showing that they're trustworthy and they're showing that they're there, th then why have that assistant at all if you're going to do everything yourself and totally. not be able to pass off? Look, and I've, I've, I'm now into my fourth decade in business. I've had, gosh, I don't even know. I didn't even try to count them up. Probably 15 executive assistants. And all of them have had access to my credit cards. I've never once been ripped off. You know, and so one of the things that we do, I mean, it's just a matter of best practices, but uh, my executive assistant has his own credit card that's in the name of the company. This is very easy to do. We use American Express. You can ask them to send another credit card to that person, then I know exactly what they've purchased on their card. Mm -hmm. It's just a way of tracking it, verifying it, especially now I don't even think about it, but, yeah. but in the early days, yeah, I would track that. Now, knowing that you're saying start small, have these like simple uh, little projects or things like that. 
what would you do in the first 30 to 60 days of onboarding an EA? Where would you kind of go from there to start to see, is this somebody that I can give more leeway to? Yeah, well, one of the things, one of the reasons why most executive assistant uh, hires fail, uh, assuming that they're qualified, they met all the, the tests mm -hmm. and everything, the reason they fail is because the supervisor expects them to read their mind. And so, you know, the secret to use an executive assistant is delegation. But here's three mistakes that a lot of leaders make when it comes to delegation. First, most hesitate. So they just don't give to the executive assistant because they think, you know, nobody can do it up to the standard that I do it. So I'm just going to do this one myself. Well, what if that person can not only meet your standard, but exceed your standard and do it better than you could do it? Mm -hmm. So another mistake that, that we often make is we abdicate. I call this the dump and run option. You know, we're in a hurry. We're rushing out of the office. We give them a quick delegation, but we're not specific about the expectations or the standards. And then when they deliver it and it doesn't meet our expectations, we're thinking, why can't I find people that have, you know, a standard of excellence? Why can't they do it up to my standards? The problem is you. Um, funny story. Years ago, we got a new dog, a, a Labradoodle. His name's Winston. We still have him to this day, amazing dog. But uh, when we brought him home, he had been potty trained by the, the breeder. And so the breeder said to us, said, look, uh, you need to be very proactive in making sure that Winston gets outside, especially in a new environment. But if he has an accident in the house, here's what you need to do. You need to find a newspaper. You need to roll it up really tight. And then you need to whack yourself on the head because it's not the dog's fault. It's your fault. Mm -hmm. And so when delegations go south, when they don't work, it's not the assistant's fault. Usually 99.9% .9 of the time, it's your fault because you abdicated and you weren't clear. Third mistake, suffocate. People micromanage. Mm -hmm. they, they, they don't just manage or articulate the result that they want, but they try to specify the process or the path to get there. Uh, look, a competent executive assistant can figure out how to get it done. All they need to know is a clear picture, and that's where it starts with you, but a clear picture of what the project looks like when it's completed to your satisfaction. And we recommend a tool that we call the Project Vision Caster, which I talk about in the book, that enables you as, as the supervisor, and it doesn't take very long, but to get really clear to specify exactly what you expect and you know, how, how you're going to measure it as a success. Give that to them. If you want to give a little bit of guidance on how to, fine, but don't suffocate them. Don't mm -hmm. micromanage. Give them reasonable autonomy to complete the task on their own terms and then evaluate the results. Not how they did it, but what they did. Yeah, I love that. And I, I will tell you, Michael, as somebody who is a big goal setter, at, there was a time when I realized I'm not sharing my goals with my team. I'm expecting mm -hmm. them to read my mind and know what we're, where we're heading and what we're doing. And I'm out there handing out tasks, but they weren't seeing the bigger vision or why we were doing right. that. And that was such a problem. So really, when you say like, it's probably your fault, I 100% believe it. Looking, I've been an entrepreneur for about 18 years. I feel bad for probably all of the people that I've either fired or they've quit thinking they're not good enough when really there was so much lack in my leadership skills at the time. So it really is something we have to kind of slow down and take the time to train, even though we're overwhelmed and that's how yes. we've hired them. It really does um, maximize them by doing that. If, if you'll just take the time to invest in communicating, and I would say over communicate, you know, you may think you're communicating because maybe you thought it and you forgot you didn't speak it mm -hmm. or you didn't write it down. But I'd say in those, you know, that first 90 day period, for sure in the first 30 day period, you need to be meeting with them constantly, giving them your best thinking. Like, like here'd be a good example. Let's say that you wanted to delegate your inbox. You didn't want to process email. And I recommend for most leaders that they have two email addresses. One is the one they give out to everybody, you know, just kind of willy nilly. Mm -hmm. And the other one is the private one that they reserve for their family, maybe their closest associates, but mostly it's a place for their executive assistant to drag emails that require their attention, okay? But what I would do initially, if you're used to managing your entire inbox, is just have your executive assistant, you know, look over your shoulder, or of course in COVID, you could just do a screen share in Zoom, but let them look over your shoulder and then think out loud as you're processing each email so that they begin to think 
like you think. Mm -hmm. So instead of them trying to read your mind or guess what you would do, they have lots of experience with them, you, with, with them looking over your shoulder and you talking through it. Then let them do it and let them tell you what, what they're doing and why they're doing it, but then supervise it. If you'll invest that time on the front end, then you can let go and they've got it. Yeah, so learning that from you, I, the, one of the things I said was traveling and airfare. I said, okay, I'm, I'm gonna do it this way. So I recorded myself on Loom. I went on to the airline, started talking through why I was picking this one and why I didn't pick that one. And then I would give her those videos and then pretty soon she would go on and explain what she would book for me. And all of a sudden it was like, okay, she gets it. She knows my system. She knows what I'm doing. Um, and I think just like having those processes of you do it first, have the look over the shoulder and you can do that with Zoom and Loom and all of these amazing tools. So that's an incredible tip. Yeah, it, it really is. And what, what you really want is to get an executive assistant who anticipates your needs ahead of time. Mm. So like I never have a conversation anymore about travel because Jim has recorded in a special spreadsheet that he has all of my preferences. You know, he knows the kinds of places I like to eat. He knows where I want to sit on an airplane. He knows what my preferred carrier is. You know, if we ever get back to flying, I haven't yeah. flown since February, <laughs> but uh, you know, what my preferred rental car company is, what kind of cars I like, you know, all that kind of stuff. He anticipates it, but here's also a game changer. And this is gonna, this is gonna sound strange for some people, but this, this is a game changer if you do it. I make no distinction between personal and professional. So um, my wife, my mom, my daughters always get a birthday gift from me. Now, don't tell them, <laughs> but I don't select the gift. Okay. I don't ensure that it gets there. All I get now is from Jim, just a notification. I don't even have to ask him to do it. You know, he's got mm -hmm. my whole calendar. He says, oh, by the way, I ordered flowers for your mom. They're going to be delivered. Her birthday's on Sunday this year, which it was, but they're going to be delivered on Friday so she can enjoy them on the weekend, you know, before her birthday. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Now, my wife actually knows that Jim does that, doesn't diminish it one bit. Right. You know, she still, you know, thinks of it as for me. I'll, another funny story. Um, we were on a uh, birthday, this was about two years ago. I went out, I took her out for a great meal that Jim set up the whole restaurant thing arranged for the cake to be delivered at the end of the meal, all that stuff. But Jim also gave me a list of 10 questions to ask her over dinner. Now, these were incredible open-end questions mm -hmm. that provoked a lot of conversation, a lot of thought, and frankly, even some tears and some laughter. So at the end of this dinner, Gail says to me, we've been married 42 years, she says to me, she says, that was like the most amazing dinner. That Thank you for this time. I mean, this was this is awesome. I feel so much closer to you right now. So now I'm feeling a little guilty. I said, I said, babe, look, I gotta be honest. Jim came up with those questions. She said, Oh, I know that, but it didn't matter. Right. She, she knew it, but it didn't matter because it wasn't the questions that had value. It was the questions that Jim provided, but it was the conversation that that facilitated. And that was worth so much to me. Yeah. Such a good story. No, and I think that might be a concern for people of, but are they going to know, or, or maybe people are embarrassed to even say they have an assistant or their assistant is sending them something or uh, almost like that guilt, I think a little bit of who am I to have an assistant? Am I really this important or should I really be outsourcing this? And I think we, we carry that guilt sometimes. Have you ever experienced that with the clients you work with? Yeah, totally. You know, they, they do feel guilty and depending on their sort of their socioeconomic background, the kind of family they're raised in, the kind of circles they run in, mm -hmm. I kind of feel like you have a duty to teach the people around you. You know, I, the, the, to me, kind of my whole view of life is stewardship, you know, that I've been given this one life and my job is to invest my time, talent, and treasure to the best of my ability so that I leave things in better shape than when I found them and generate a return on the investment, right? And so it's, it's penny wise and pound foolish to think I'm gonna save money or not have an assistant and I'm just gonna do these lower level things that, for, that first of all, deprive somebody else of income, mm -hmm. right? And second of all, deprive them of the opportunity to express their gifts. And, and third, kind of keep me in my drudgery zone where I don't add the most value. And this is why people are overwhelmed. This is why people are working 
you know, 60, 70, sometimes 80 hours a week and still not getting it all done. Okay, so check this out. So the, the, during the pandemic or at the beginning of the pandemic, we realized right away that we had a lot of young um, parents that were in our employment and they were struggling now suddenly with trying to manage all the little kids under their feet and trying to work and all that. So we said, we're going to go from 40 hours, uh, 40 hour work week to a uh, 32 hour work week. So we're going to just work six hours a day mm -hmm. and from nine to three, and we're not going to dock people's pay. And we're just going to see if we can accomplish the same amount of work. Guess what? This is shocking. Our product productivity actually skyrocketed. We, we were already highly productive because we encouraged people to work in their desire mm -hmm. zone, not their drudgery zone. But this didn't, this didn't impact at all. People just prioritized. They got the 20% done that drives 80% of the results. The business went on and we're having the biggest, best year of our history. Yeah. And I just think what like the loyalty that that brings with your, your employees to you and just, I think that's such a wow thing for them to, to be able to experience and witness and have you do that. So I'm not surprised that the productivity went up because I think we do a lot of busy work throughout our day and getting rid of two hours of things that we didn't need to be doing in the first place only improves that productivity. So amazing kind of like that, that that happened. It's kind of like that Friday before you go on vacation. Yes. <laughs> radically productive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or, or knowing like there's certain things coming up, like that happens when women are having babies and they know they're working harder than they've ever worked in like month eight and month nine, knowing the baby is coming, right? You start That's to it. increase that productivity. Yeah, absolutely. The day before vacation, all of that. Um, okay. So I want to ask you, um, when you are hiring this world-class assistant, what is something that really distinguish distinguishes good to great? How do we start to separate that? Yeah, I want somebody that that exhibits certain kinds of attitudes. First, first of all, I'm looking for somebody that's servant-hearted. You know, that just and and frankly, I look this for this in any employee, and I I try to you know model my own life on this. But somebody that just delights in serving other people, that that lives to make other people successful, that lives to grow fruit on other people's trees. So that's one thing. Another thing is I'm looking for somebody that's committed to excellence, who doesn't just you know kind of phone it in but is fully engaged and, you know, deli delivers and delights in delivering outstanding results. So this would be a couple of things I'd look for. Love that. All right. Last question. Any final advice that you want to share with somebody who's considering looking for an EA? Maybe they've got somebody, but they haven't trained properly. They haven't maximized them. Um, I would love to hear last piece of advice. Well, it's never too late to start or to reset the uh, relationship. So I would just take responsibility and, you know, here's, here's kind of a funny example, but I had a guy that was cutting my hair and, you know, I wasn't an executive assistant, obviously, but this was just somebody that was, was cutting my hair. He had been on the case for about four weeks. My previous guy had moved. He recommended this guy and this guy was destroying my hair. I mean, he was giving me like the worst haircut. I hated the haircut I was getting. Yeah. So I, I, the first thing I thought was, well, I needed, I totally need a new guy. And I thought, wait a second, I don't think I've been explicit with him. So I said to him, the next time I had a haircut, I said to him, look, I have not been getting the haircut that I want. And that's on me because I haven't been explicit with you and I've kind of expected you to read my mind. So I've taken the liberty, and this, this is kind of embarrassing to admit, but I've actually drawn some drawings here on my iPad and I wanna show you exactly what I'm looking for. Well, he was totally taken back, taken back, but every time since then, that was about three months ago, he's cut my hair perfectly. I wouldn't leave him for anything, but it took me Mm -hmm. resetting the relationship and getting explicit about what I wanted. Was he offended? No, he was grateful that I took the time to explain right. it to him rather than just moving on to somebody else. Yeah. And that's a lot of times what happens when we do this with clients and, and employees, they just move on and they think this isn't working versus actually having us give up, give that information and then being receptive to that. So I love that story. Michael, thank you for sharing. Where can people buy the book, go find out more about you online, any place that you want to send them? Yeah, you can find it at yourworldclassassistant.com. Uh, all my general stuff can be found at michaelhyatt.com, and that's Hyatt with a Y, H-Y-A-T-T, -T, michaelhyatt.com. But there are links there to my podcast, my business coaching program, the Full Focus Planner, which I know you've talked about on this show, yes, and all the stuff that we do. Yeah. Michael, thank you so much. This was amazing. Your book and books, plural, I should say, are definitely must-reads. So thank you so much for being here today. Thanks, Stacey. Thanks for having me on.